everyone, and welcome to Meet the Mental Health Professionals Night. I'm Carrie Holmes. I'm the pro bono director at the Harriet View High Center, and along with Ron Reichstein of Youngman Reichstein, I'm the co-chair of the Beverly Hills Bar Association Family Law Section. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, and thank you to our program chairs, Ellen Stein and Deborah Frank, for all their hard work in putting this together. And please also join us for our next evening program on May 19th uh, for our top 10 tax tips. You will receive your MCLE certificate and materials shortly after the program ends. After the program, please take a moment to complete the survey. A survey link will be included with your MCLE certificate. The Family Law Section and all of its programs is sponsored by Soberlink. Soberlink system combines a portable breathalyzer with wireless technology, trusted for use in child custody cases since 2011. They are the only system that combines court admissibility in all 50 states and Canada, facial recognition and tamper detection, real-time results, and easy-to-read advanced reporting. Trust the experts in remote alcohol monitoring technology for your custody cases involving alcohol. Next, we have White Zuckerman, Warsawski, Luna, and Hunt. They provide a wide, uh, a wide variety of resources to complete almost any project, large or small. They also provide traditional accounting and tax practice services. We invite you to contact them to discuss your specific uh, accounting needs and learn how they can be of service to you. And Our Family Wizard. Our Family Wizard is a secure co-parenting platform that supports divorced or separated parents in managing the daily responsibilities of raising children. Specialized features help co-parents organize routines, share files, track expenses and payments, check in at exchanges, send messages, and more, all while thoroughly documenting their activity. With that, I'll hand things over to Ellen Stein and Deborah Frank, who worked very hard to organize tonight's event. Thank you, and good evening. Thank you, Carrie and Ron, and thank all of you for joining us tonight. Um, we have a terrific turnout for tonight's program, close to 90 registrants, which I think speaks to the importance of mental health professionals to the family law community. So thank you all for joining us. Before I introduce our panelists and my co-chair, I'm going to take a minute to describe the program format. We're going to begin with our panel. Um, please use the chat function to submit any questions you have. And at the end of the panel discussion, time permitting, I'll pose some of those questions to the panelists. Following the panel, the mental health professionals will introduce themselves highlighting their areas of expertise and services they provide to the family law community. Mental health professionals, we're gonna ask you to keep your remarks to four minutes so everyone can be heard. We'll welcome any hot tips you have for attorneys, suggestions on how to help our clients move forward into the post-pandemic work world or anything else you think we need to know. And mental health professionals, if we don't call on you, please let us know at the end. Um, of the other mental health professionals speaking. Um, as Carrie mentioned, all attendees will receive an electronic reference booklet of questionnaires completed by the mental health professionals. At the completion of the formal portion of our program, all attendees who wish to participate will be randomly assigned to two 10 minute breakout rooms to mix, meet and mingle with colleagues. My, my co-chair, Deborah Frank, is a certified family law specialist and practices in Century City. She is an active and generous member of the family law community. Among her contributions, she currently serves on the board of the Association of Certified Family Law Specialists as a member benefit director. She's a member of the ACFLS's amicus and legislative committees and is secretary of the ACFLS Charitable Foundation Board. For many years, she was the editor and associate editor of ACFLS's Family Law Specialist and continues to serve on the journal committee. She also served on the editorial newsletter committee of AFCC. She's a past president of the Family Law American Inns of Court a past chair of LACPA and BHBA's family law sections and on and on and on. If there's work to be done, Deborah digs in and gets it done. 
So it's been a pleasure to work with her on this program. Now, turning to our panelists, um, Judge Mark Juhas is not a stranger to any of you. Um, he currently sits in Department 64 downtown as a trial judge, and he's been on the Los Angeles Superior Court since November of 2002. He's a member of several committees for the Los Angeles County Superior Court, including serving as chair of the Access and Fairness Committee. For the Administration Office of Courts, he's currently on the Elkins Family Law Implementation Task Force, Self-Represented Litigant Task Force, and the Family and Juvenile Advisory Committee. He was a member of the Elkins Family Law Task Force. He currently chairs the Family Law Curriculum Design Committee for the Center for Judicial Education and Research. And he's the current president of the California chapter of the Association of Family and Conciliation Courts. He as well is generous with his time to both the family law community and to the judiciary. And we appreciate him taking the time to join us this evening. Michael Kretzmer is also well known to you. He's a partner with Summers Levine and Kretzner in Los Angeles. He's the recent past president of the Association of Family and Conciliation Courts, California chapter, a fellow of the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers, a certified family law specialist, and a former member and officer of the State Bar of California's Family Law Executive Committee. His practice focuses on child abuse inner partner violence, and complex custody litigation. He has been lead trial counsel in hundreds of family probate, juvenile dependency, and contested adoption, adoption cases over the last 30 years. He serves as minors counsel in family, juvenile dependency, and probate courts, and has served as special master in the family court and has been lead counsel in more than 50 appeals from the family and juvenile dependency courts. He also was generous with his time teaching and lecturing. And um, personally, I found him to be really generous in answering questions from members of the bar. Um, we appreciate that Mike has left his, left his dog Kip tonight for us. Um, <laughs> And we'll let him get home as soon as the program is over. He is home. Finally, we're looking forward to hearing from Dr. J. Joe Cordenova, who's an experienced adult and child psychiatrist specializing in mediation, co-parenting counseling, collaborative law, attorney-client consultation, and family therapy. She received her undergraduate medical degree at University of California, Los Angeles, and also did her internship in pediatrics there. She continued as a resident at UCLA studying adult psychiatry and then completed a fellowship at UCLA in child psychiatry. She's board certified in both adult and child psychiatry. She was selected by the Los Angeles Superior Court judges to serve on the downtown Los Angeles Psychiatric Custody Evaluation Panel and has performed numerous child custody evaluations. She's an experienced mediator with expertise in complex, challenging, and high conflict family law cases. She also practices collaborative law. Um, she mediates divorce cases privately and has served as a parenting plan coordinator for high conflict custody issues. Um, she also works as a mediation trainer and speaks at continuing education seminars. We're delighted to have all of the panelists with us. And now I'll turn the panel over to Deborah. OK, good evening, everyone. It's good to see all of you. Dr. Portnova, why don't we just start off with you by having you describe to us the various roles of mental health professionals beyond child custody evaluator and expert witness, and perhaps provide us with some examples of how you were able to contribute to the case as a mental health professional. Well, I would be delighted. First, let me say hello to a lot of my friends. It's been a while. It's great to see you, some old faces, some new faces. It's very exciting. Um, I really love my job. And I think part of why I love my job so much is there's so many different ways to interface in the family law world. As 
you guys heard, um, I have been so blessed to be able to work as a custody evaluator at one point in my career, but I have moved on to work as a mediator um, where I work either alone or with a lawyer. Um, ultimately, I always have a lawyer involved, but I have mediated um, agreements and then had them written up by um, the lawyer uh, that where I work with. Generally, there's several lawyers that I work with. I love doing that kind of work. I love watching people come to agreements that they author um, and that they can help get their needs met most directly by working together in an open and uh, transparent process where I work as a neutral. I also work in the collaborative law dynamics and sometimes I work as a neutral uh, coach for both parties. That's a single mental health person in the collaborative team. I've also worked in the collaborative team as a coach for one or the other parties. And I enjoy both. It's a different set skill set when you are the neutral for both parties versus when you're just working with either the mom or the dad, but it's, it's wonderful. And I love working in the transparent process of the collaborative um, dynamics. I love working in terms of trying to find an interest-based solution to the needs of the family. And there's a lot of um, uh, support for when people author their own divorce, they're much more likely to have um, compliance and less resistance and less resentment. And at the end of the day, especially when there's children involved, these people have to have a relationship, whether they want to be involved with each other's life or not, they do have to be better for the family if they come to an agreement that has the most compliance and the least amount of resistance and the most least amount of resentment. And when they can author it themselves, it's often very um, uh, binding and helpful. I do work behind the scenes with lawyers as a consul as a consultant, a consultant where I will help the client through the process that's not a transparent process that's a very different hat that I wear where uh, an attorney will call me I got a call today where they have a very difficult client um, I'll help the attorney help the client get through the process and understand the process and sometimes help deliver difficult messages that the client doesn't want to hear or can't really fully absorb it's different than the, the person's therapist I'm not their therapist I work with the consultant but I do help them understand um, what they're trying to accomplish through the litigation platform that they that may or may not be something that they can do and the lawyer's having trouble. I love being a consultant. Sometimes I help them just um, deal with the results of a report, which may be either positive or negative, just to help them understand what that means. Um, lawyers call me sometimes to help them um, move forward to fight the report or to accept the report. So it depends on when I get called and what kinds of things I do, but that's not as a neutral, that is working with just the client and the attorney. I do family therapy, which I love. I'm trained in family systems. Uh, those of you who are therapists understand that, um, how a system works. And I will work with the family if it's reunification therapy or it's post-divorce or whether there's no divorce at all pending, just some difficult family dynamics. I have a special needs child. So I know a lot about special needs families and, and I will help sometimes when there's a special needs recent diagnosis and a family's having trouble coping with that. Um, a last but not least, the other thing I do is parent plan coordinator. Um, that is when um, the two parties agree and to allow me to have some ability to make some decisions that they can't seem to make on their own. They keep ending up in court over and over again. And it's really designed to keep them out of court as much as possible. I have had one case now for seven years that I've kept out of court and all they were doing was going to court before. So I feel very excited about that kind of work. And those are the different things that I do. Um, I hope that wasn't too fast and too much, but I love it all. It's very different hats, very different roles, different boundaries, different criteria. And one thing I do very much believe in is once I wear one hat to a family, I will not be the family therapist and then the consultant and then the mediator. And then I won't do that. Just one hat for life. So that if there's plenty of people, my, my good friends on this, on this call and else, elsewhere can do a lot of work that I do. So there's no need for me to do it all. I do one thing for family. And okay. I know that there was other questions you wanted me to ask, answer. Um, yeah. 
what kind of work have I been doing over Zoom? What are the benefits? And will I continue post pandemic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got to tell you guys, I was scared to death about Zoom. I was scared to death when this thing happened. I closed my practice and I haven't been in my office in a year. And I was like, holy God almighty, how am I going to do therapy with my seven-year-olds and my 10-year-olds without my Uno cards and without my coloring books and without my Etch-a-Sketch? How am I going to do family therapy when I don't have them around the couch? I'm here to tell you it can happen. (laughs) I actually am doing therapy and family therapy and mediation and collaborative law and PPC work, all of it online. If I can do it, you can do it. And I got to tell you, there's, it's, it's a different platform. You have to use your skill set differently. It's it's a little weird. I will give you that, but it's very doable. And you know what do they say? Um, something about necessity is the mother of nature, invention, or something. We had to do it, so we did it. And the best part of this is I am now working with colleagues that I adore and admire up and down the state of California that I never could have worked with before. I've got cases in Santa Barbara, San Diego, Irvine, Palo Alto, San Francisco. Could never do that before unless I got on a plane. Mm -hmm. So there's some real benefits to this. So you really can harvest um, colleagues that you never could have harvested before and use them in a way that, so the answer is yes, there are benefits. Yes, there are challenges. And yes, I will continue to do this post pandemic. I think that, do you want me to stop there and let other people talk? Well, if, they, if they'd like to, I'll, I can go, I'll go through a couple of questions also. What about okay. your, um, what is, what do you, how do you see your ethical obligation if domestic violence or child abuse is revealed? Um, so this, regardless of the pandemic or not, is, you know, if you're doing therapy and you hear about um, something that's reportable, you just, you obviously report. Um, and that's not different post pandemic or not. Um, and you're obligated to do that. You're mandated to do that. And of course I do that. Um, I think that um, p- there's been some real interesting things that have arisen because of the pandemic. Um, people living together on top of each other and not being able to leave the house has stirred up a lot of family dynamics. And we have seen some families get closer and some families that barely can tolerate the sight of each other with an increased amount of irritability and et cetera. Um, I personally have not seen more abuse or domestic violence because of the pandemic. I know that that has been reported elsewhere, but my practice, I haven't seen that. I have seen um, both better and worse parenting. Um, Parents have really stepped up. I mean, you know, trying to have a job and take care of your kids and have them go to school has not been easy, but the majority of the parents have they have been able to really do a good job but they're much more tired and they are you know sometimes irritable but they've been really open to talk to me about how to cope through this process and for the most part i've been very lucky that my my caseload has done very well um and you asked me some questions i'm reading from our our notes here um there has been some really interesting pandemic consequences i've seen Um, couples that were not living together all of a sudden like living together because they couldn't handle the idea of being apart for any longer and way in the beginning of this we weren't sure how long it was going to last and no one was vaccinated I've seen the pandemic be used for custody which has been very unfortunate because it was not supposed to be done that way but it was used as a wedge to make sure that daddy's girlfriend can't go see daddy if daddy sees a girlfriend or vice versa if mommy's boyfriend comes over. So that's been unfortunate. But I think a lot of us have seen that and a lot of us have been able to um, sort of address that as best as we can without putting the kids in the middle. But the kids have been put in the middle sometimes. Um, I think that it's been an excuse, but it's starting to fall away. Thank God. Um, We're coming out the other side of this. And um, at least in my case, in my practice, I've had several parents use the pandemic as a reason for not allowing custody and hiding behind it. But the good news is the kids went um, and that got addressed and it just made us have to be much more creative. I mean, there was, you know, a lot of visitations outside and things like that at the beginning and a lot of Lysol and hand washing and all kinds of things. But the good news is I think the shield 
of the pandemic as an excuse for custody is is going to be um, less and less. And I think that's all good. Okay. Um, I've seen a couple of people retire earlier and I've seen a couple of people stop working as much or go to part-time because they just couldn't juggle it all. Um, I don't know what the long-term impact of that is. And I see the question that asked me that question, but I absolutely have seen how work relates change. I've seen a lot of people in the 60 year old uh, you're an old up group, think about retiring earlier. And I've seen a lot of parents go, you know, part-time because they just can't juggle the Zoom school. How much of that will bounce back? I don't know. I really don't. To be determined. All right, thank you. And I think that's all the questions that you asked okay. me. All right, part. thank you. Judge Uhas, Um, when do you find mental health professionals helpful um, in moving a case forward? Wait, we can't hear him. You're, you're mute. <laughs> Okay, I was hoping I'd get through this entire uh, presentation without somebody saying, you're on mute, but apparently that didn't happen. So there you go. Um, I think that um, a judge's ability to order mental health uh, professionals is really pretty limited. So when Dr. Portnova was talking about behind the scenes stuff, I think that's really actually quite helpful. And um, having a mental health professional that's, that's maybe not a therapist, but is explaining the process and what's going to happen and how it's going to feel and what it's going to look like and what to expect um, and maybe be um, a sounding board outside of the therapeutic setting, but more in sort of a legal therapeutic setting, if you will, can be really quite helpful. Um, I, I think that there are times that mental health professionals, obviously there's counseling and there's conjoint counseling and all of those things, which are very helpful. But like I said earlier, you know, my ability as a judge to order counseling is actually quite limited. If you look at the statute, I think many people come in and they want the judge to order this, that, or the other thing, and that's not possible. Again, Dr. Portnova and, and maybe Mr. Kretzmer um, are gonna talk a bit about um, parent plan coordinators, can't order them. Um, so if they are stipulated to, that's great. But sometimes the stipulation, the parenting plan coordinator becomes the lightning rod. And so rather than fighting about the kid, you're fighting about the parenting plan coordinator or what the terms are gonna be or what the order is gonna look like. And so rather than being helpful, they become but yet another uh, set of problems. Um, I was also interested when Dr. Portanova was talking about um, her statewide work. Uh, I think that because of the, uh, the pandemic and there's many things that are bad about COVID, but there are many, many things that are good about COVID that I'm hoping that we're going to keep, remote appearances, remote counseling, that sort of thing, um, allows you to take advantage of people uh, that maybe are, uh, are distant and have different expertise than a local person. Um, and so I think there's all kinds of opportunities for mental health professionals beyond the sort of the standard child custody evaluation, um, uh, therapy, conjoint counseling, you know, that sort of stuff. <clears throat> Okay. Um, what, what testimony from uh, mental health professionals do you find most helpful? You know, what? So I think it depends who the mental health professional is, obviously, right? I mean, if it's a child custody evaluator, then obviously we have the Sanchez issues and all of those sorts of things. Right. Um, but I think if you have a counselor who is um, able to uh, describe what's going on, to sort of distill the issue between the parents or distill the issue between the, the a parent A and the kid and the kids and all that sort of stuff. I think that can be really very, very helpful and very enlightening. Um, and so again, um, I my experience has been that having a child custody evaluator with a 733 and having that mental health professional come in, typically I think 733s are not typically well used um, I think having a mental health professional, I think you need to know your bench officer, um, having a mental health professional come into a court um, to tell the judge that domestic violence is a bad thing is probably not the best use of a mental health professional. Um, so I think you need to uh, figure out what are you trying to accomplish? Why is that person there? What do you want from them? What do you think the judge is going to get from them? Um, does your judge have a lot of experience in this area, have no experience in this area, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts about the utility of like uh, PPA ones and twos? So I think um, 
So, I mean, this is part of a much larger discussion, obviously. Um, child custody evaluations are becoming increasingly rare. Uh, there are fewer folks that are doing them. Uh, I think that, um, I think a, a number of years ago, they were probably overused. Uh, I think that we're becoming a little more sophisticated about them. That may be that because there just aren't as many folks doing them that they're not as available. They're quite expensive. Uh, and sometimes I think they are, uh, are misused from the standpoint that uh, sort of a, a, a uh, a short evaluation, uh, come in, talk to mom, talk to dad, talk to the kids, maybe talk to one or two collaterals, is really what you need to do just to sort of to figure out what's going on. Um, so I think the PPA-1 and PPA-2 uh, can be very useful and very helpful. Probably not, not by the time it comes to a long cause trial. Right. Uh, I think they're, you know, more of a, an RFO sort of thing. Um, although, again, it depends, it depends what the issues are. And so, uh, if you can get your your trial court or your um, home court to order a PPA one PPA two as part of a larger hearing, um, that's it. It may make sense in the right case. All of all of these tools isn't one size fits all. Minors counsel isn't good for every case. Mental health professionals aren't good for every case. Um, you know, uh, having counseling isn't good for every case. So they're they're tools that need to be used sparingly and um, thoughtfully. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mike, in your practice, in what roles do you find mental health professionals most useful and how do you utilize them? Well, it, there's a whole bunch of ways in which attorneys should and can utilize mental health professionals. Uh, J. Jo and her presentation hit on some of them. And 90% of the time, it's using them outside of court. Um, it's really important to know the limitations of what mental health professionals can bring to the table when you're handling a client or you're handling a particular case. Um, first of all, you know, a lot of times attorneys think of mental health professionals in their capacity as an expert to come in and testify and educate the judge or help bolster particular points that we want to make in some custody case. Um, truth of the matter is, as, as Judge Juhas just said, we're having fewer and fewer of those instances. For instance, child custody evaluations over the last couple of decades, when I've gone around lecturing about uh, using mental health professionals in uh, the courtroom capacity and for child custody evaluations, I used to say, tell me the last time you had an uh, evaluation done by somebody under the age of 50. Then I moved it up and said, when's the last time you had it by somebody under the age of 60? I'm crowding in on when's the last time you had somebody in the age of 70 doing it. And we in Southern California, certainly the experience that I had as president of AFCC, and I think which Judge Yu has, has as the current president, is that we're not finding new mental health professionals coming along to do child custody evaluations. And quite frequently, child custody evaluations are perhaps the least helpful of what really works for us. I think that Judge Juhas was right in saying that they were overused. There was a point in time when child custody evaluations were you know, the latest fashion. That's what they were. And they were an easy tool to get somebody in and say, tell me what I should do, basically, because they would make recommendations for custody and the like. And, and, and uh, I'll say it, I think it took some pressure off some judges who didn't want to have to deal with that or didn't feel they had the tools to deal with that. Sometime after child custody evaluations became popular, but very expensive, minors counsel became the next thing because there was a tendency to use minors counsel, at least in my experience. I get judges that say, Mike, go out and talk to these people, see if you can settle the case, okay? You know, it was another shorthand way of kind of getting to resolution. Not necessarily bad, but it was again, something else to do. But the real benefit to me as a lawyer in using a mental health therapist is from the very beginning. I may use a mental health therapist or a, a mental health practitioner as a consultant at the beginning, telling the mental health professional, I've got this client, here's the situation. I have the following concerns. Can you help me with regard to how I should approach the client? Or would it be a good idea for the mental health professional, myself and the client to sit down to discuss the ramifications of what's going on? I've used mental health professionals to help me 
uh, write up uh, the parameters of a move away or an order to a mental health professional that we're going to use in a child custody evaluation. I've used mental health professionals to help me identify other people in the area who might be really good at doing co-parenting counseling or have special expertise in the kinds of therapy that there might be necessary for a child who has emotional or other challenges, those kinds of things. Um, I'm using the mental health professional's brain to help me assess areas that, you know, as an attorney, I'm just not necessarily very good at making the assessment about. I will use a mental health professional to help me evaluate the works as being done by other mental health professionals in the case. Are they being of help to the family or are they impediment? Are there things that are being missed that a mental health professional might suggest that we get the other people involved in the case to focus on? Those are just, you know, some of the areas. And then, of course, there's the 733 aspect. Boy, we got back a custody evaluation or something else. Will somebody please take a look at it and see what's going on? This is all a matter of resources, okay? If you have the ability to take advantage of um, some of the really good mental health professionals who are out there, then as an attorney, I've always found it very helpful. But there is a resource angle because mental health professionals charge for you know what they do. And you've got to be realistic about what your case can afford. Um, I think that um, Judge Uhas also made a point that I always make, which is know your judge. No matter what the case is, is your judge somebody who's going to be interested in hearing from a mental health professional? Are they sophisticated with regards to the kinds of language and theories and the research and the literature and the other things that might be good? So that may guide you in how you choose or choose to engage, you know, a mental health professional in any one of these areas. Okay. All right. Uh, can you um, highlight ethical differences between attorneys and mental health professionals about reporting of domestic violence and child abuse? Well, I generally find that most attorneys are highly ethical and mental health professionals have a questionable kind of, you know, view. No. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the question in a sense is... Um, I really don't, as an attorney, you're not a mandated reporter. If we're going to go to child abuse. Lawyers are not mandated reporters. Mental health professionals are. Okay? Mental health professionals oftentimes report out of their good conscience in what they're learning through the therapy norm. But I've also had plenty of instances where a mental health professional is reporting uh, potential abuse or a suspicion of abuse because quite, you know, candidly, there are licensing issues. And you can get in trouble with your licensing board as a mental health professional for not reporting something that even ultimately isn't determined to be abusive in terms of the behavior. Because the licensing boards are, are kind of this Damocles sword that hangs over the head of almost every mental health professional. And over the last 10 to 15 years, that's become an even greater concern for a lot of mental health professionals is if I do A, am I going to suffer a consequence, you know, B from the licensing here? Um, there is an interesting issue that came up recently that I'll try and be brief about. And it had to do with um, an order in a case I have for safe harbor therapy. Safe harbor therapy um, is generally a situation where there are therapists involved with the parents and or the children. And there is oftentimes in an order or by some kind of an agreement, a prohibition against the therapist testifying in court. The idea being that uh, having safe harbor increases the likelihood that participants in the therapy are going to be open, more forthcoming, and therefore a therapist will have a better opportunity to work effectively with people if she doesn't believe or he doesn't believe that uh, the participants in the therapy are shading their answers or are, are holding back because they're afraid to say something. So in a recent case I had, there were, uh, there were two therapists, two children. Both children made disclosures to their respective therapist, which led the therapist to believe that uh, 
there was a reasonable suspicion of child abuse and child abuse that needed to be reported to DCFS through the hotline. They, the therapist, in fact, did that. The therapist then, at, simultaneously, concurrently, informed father and mother of the fact that they were making reports. And given the fact that DCFS and doing their investigations tends not to move very quickly these days for a, a number of reasons, some good, some not so good, um, I felt necessary to take the information from the therapist and seek ex parte relief for a change of custody, modification of custody, based upon the uh, reporting of the suspected child abuse. Well, other side opposed and said, no, 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 safe harbor, you can't use that information. And in my case, the judge said, that's right, this is supposed to be safe harbor, there's a prohibition against, the uh, against anybody uh, having the therapist prepare declarations or testifying at trial or deposition. Okay. Created quite the dilemma as to what you do. DCFS continued to drag its feet. So question there was, you know, what do we do with safe harbor therapy? What's the ethical responsibilities? What can you do as a lawyer? The stipulation that had been drafted, I was subsequent counsel on the case, did not include a carve out for um, allowing the therapist to make disclosures in the event they heard about child abuse. One thing I would do if I was a practitioner in subsequent cases is I would include as part of my stipulation, I require there be a carve out so that in the event there is a situation that demands that kind of attention, you have some kind of remedy. I know that Judge Uhas and I and, and some others have discussed this and I think Judge Uhas may have a view that that would be an expected carve out uh, in effect, that there would be uh, an inherent exception for some of your report child abuse. I don't wanna speak for Judge Uhas, but it's, it's an issue that, you know, that does come up and in terms of the ethics, um, again, I think that, you know, I, I don't have any issues. I have not had any issues with any mental health professionals on ethics. Um, and rarely do I have it necessarily with lawyers, but this is an issue of practical significance that can have great ramifications for how we protect children in these situations. So that's, that's an overview of some of the concerns that I have. But as a general rule, look, I find that people make the reports when they need to make them. Um, and I think they make them conscientiously. Okay. Um, Ellen, do you have any questions of our people here? Yeah, I did have a few. And thank you all for, for the information you've provided so far. Um, Dr. Portnova, one of the roles that I know you've served in, and I don't think you um, explained was the role of the child specialist in a collaborative case. And I think that's a really unique and interesting role that it might be helpful for um, our audience to hear about when you unmute yourself. Okay, um, so collaborative law is a, a team that tries to have both parties available to a process that's transparent. And although there are as many as two lawyers and two mental health people and a neutral financial, um, and that's one model, there's several models. It could be as simple as one lawyer, one financial and one mental health, but, and I won't take too much time, but there's different ways to do this. Um, the idea is for, um, the parties to come to an agreement that they author based on their interests. But obviously um, those interests can be at, at complete odds with each other. And it often is over the children as one pivot point. Um, and one way to unbundle that or to break that apart and make it um, uh, a better process is to hire a, not just a coach for each party, but a neutral child specialist. And I had a case just recently where it really did a great job. I can tell you very quickly, it was um, two people who were going to get divorced and um, the wife was going to move to Idaho with their special needs child who was um, in her mid-teens in a special program uh, to address her Down syndrome 
and her get her an education that would qualify her for a high school diploma. And she wanted to move to Idaho and um, they were ready to do that. And all of a sudden um, they, they came to the agreement that they would hire a child specialist. That child specialist came in um, and assessed the case and realized that this kid was doing the best she could ever do in the school she was already at and going to Idaho would be very disruptive. And so they then had to take that piece of information, having spent their whole life trying to get this child as mainstreamed as possible with this new piece of information that they wouldn't have had any other way to say, hey, this, is, this kid is in a special program. She will get her high school diploma in this program. Going to Idaho will be very upsetting to her and not easily transferable. And there was a residential program where she could go and live independently as possible and get a, hopefully some kind of a um, undergraduate degree. So bringing in a sp child specialist caused it not to be a he said, she said, or you can't go or you can't take this kid. It really put it into a neutral place. And they were both able to hear that information with an open mind and an open heart and come to a better resolution where they were able to still accomplish their goals, the mother moving to Idaho and the father not being left with this kid who he's never taken care of because those were the two choices. They came to a neutral place where they just postponed some parts of their dreams of moving forward and for the benefit of this kid. And it all happened because of a neutral child specialist that was hired in a case that was completely deadlocked. So the child specialist then is bringing the voice of the child to the parents? Yes, in a and neutral it, way, not hired by either party, but as a neutral. And and the child specialist can interview the child or the children? Yes, talk to the children on behalf of both parties for the purpose of bringing it to the team so the team can put that information out for both parties to resolve some sort of a deadlock. And in this case, you know, she wanted to go to Idaho. He didn't want to be left with this kid and she didn't, and she wanted to take this kid. And so they were like, there was neither of those choices were good for this child. So with that neutral input and the information, they were both able to come to a two or three year plan where they could implement in steps what was best for this kid and still do what each of them wanted to do. And I guess the follow-up to that question to both Mr. Kretzner and to Judge Juhas is um, to the judge how you um, how you um, allow the voice of the child to be heard in your courtroom, um, whether you like attorneys to have a child interviewed by a mental health professional, you know how you handle that in different circumstances. And Mr. Kretzner, what what form do you find most useful. So let me move back for just a second to Dr. Portnova. That result is something you would not have gotten in a courtroom. That's so exactly I think, right. So I think that's that's something to keep in mind that um, if you if you have the right um, out of courtroom uh, approach, you're going to get a different, and this sounds like better, result than probably you would have gotten in a courtroom. Um, how do you get the voice of the child in? You know, there's the statutory requirements uh, for mm -hmm. preference. Um, if the kid's a recipient witness, then the judge really has um, far more limited ability to, um, to affect that testimony, and that, that's the way it should be. Um, there's some, um, a move afoot, uh, SB 654, I think it is, uh, which is before the legislature now, uh, to talk about uh, child preference testimony. I mean, it depends. I mean, you know, I hate to sort of duck the question, but mm -hmm. it depends on how old the kid is, what the issues are, is the child of sufficient age and maturity. I mean, all of those things that go in it. There's a, you know, a 17 and a half year old is probably going to sit in the witness stand and testify. Um, a seven year old probably is not. And so whether you're going to have um, a mental health professional interview with all the hearsay objections that go along with that, um, or whether you're going to um, have a minor's counsel get involved somehow, it depends on so many different facts and it's so case and so fact specific. Mm -hmm. I will tell you that one of my standard and more sardonic statements to my clients is that the courtroom is a really lousy place to try and resolve custody disputes. For the most part, you know, you're asking somebody who's worn a black robe who might've woke up that day and had a terrible morning or is having problems with their own kid or something else is going on and doesn't know you from Adam 
try to figure out what has gone on in your family, no matter how long the pleadings, no matter how much information there is, you've got a complete stranger many times trying to make decisions that the parents must admit they can't make. And that's a really hard thing, for, I think, for parents to have to go in and say, we failed here and we can't resolve it. And getting the voice of the child before the court, I think, is becoming a more and more difficult task. The most common way to do that, not necessarily the most useful or effective way, was through a child custody evaluation. Right. Okay? Having kids on the stand years ago while I was minors counsel, and I had a case in front of his greatness, Judge Uhas, and we put the kids on the stand. And after it was over, Judge Uhas came to me and he said, I am never, ever doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> it's just you're putting kids in an impossible position. And I had a 17 and a half year old in a case with a judge who's no longer sitting in family law where he refused to have the kid testify about preference. That's 17 and a half in his last year of high school. And he did that. At first, I thought, you're nuts. Kid's 70 and a half, let him have his say. But the truth of the matter is the judge said he's going to get on the stand. He's going to say things potentially, which will have an adverse effect on his relationship with his mother or father going forward that may last years. And I think a lot of times we're not conscious of the effect that that kind of thing can have. And the idea that on a preference, in a preference setting, that we're going to have the kids testify, you really are putting them oftentimes in an impossible position, or you're putting them in a position where it's just so transparent that they're grinding an ax for reasons that we don't necessarily know. So it is a very, very delicate and dangerous dance anytime I think you end up putting a kid on the stand. I know that in France, they don't allow kids to testify, period. A matter of fact, they don't allow parents in custody proceedings to testify about what their children want. It's a really interesting system and without going into it in any kind of detail. You know, the question is what kind of reliable information is the court getting about the children? How does the court get to know the children? Does the court need to know the child, so to speak, in order to make an informed decision about what, what should happen in any custody case? And frequently, frankly, I find more and more people that just want a decision made. I think that good judges with good life experience, you know, who pay attention can make very good common sense calls in custody cases without having to put the child at the peril of being on the stand. And the judges have the ability to control whether a child's going to testify or not. And we've all been in situations where we've seen attorneys who, I've got to call the child. We've got to have the child testify. Good luck. <laughs> you know. Get on a blackjack a, and the helmet and get out of the way. I have a quick nuts and bolts question for you, counsel. When you work with a mental health professional as a consultant, yes. how do you go about retaining that consultant so that you're protecting well, privilege? Well, it, as a consultant, as you keep the person as a consultant, you have a privilege. Their, right. their work product is not discoverable. Mm -hmm. Whatever they talk to you about is between you. It's attorney client. It's wow. attorney work product privilege. Where you run into dangers, and I've had this happen, is where somebody retains somebody as a consultant and then wants to convert them to okay. the testifying expert. And I've had that done. And guess what? All of a sudden, Pandora's box is open. <laughs> every note, every phone call, every conversation with everybody... All of that becomes discoverable. So, so oftentimes, you know, the best practice is you retain somebody as a consultant. You do your consultancy agreement. They're not going to disclose. You're not going to disclose. It's all kept, you know, in a nice, neat box for you. And then you have a separate agreement that you do with a testifying expert. You don't cross-contaminate as best you can. Those people, okay, because if the testifying expert then ends up talking to the consultant, guess what? testifying expert can talk about everything you talk to the consultant about. Okay, so you want to watch out for those kinds of things. You keep a very, you know, a very large and very firm and 
a big wall, a big wall, like they're building along Fire the wall. Wall. The wall. Half, okay? half of, more than half of my practice is consulting, more than half. And it's been that way for 30 years. And it has to be a separate retainer and it's work product privilege. It's, yeah, but before everybody gets all, gets carried away about it's work product privilege, I might suggest that there's a new case. It's slightly different. The facts are slightly different, but it's Curtis versus Superior Court. It's from March. And that was a case where a consulting expert was had to be disclosed. And so I think that you've got lots of protections. I'm not saying that, but I would not take entirely to the bank that you're going to be that you're going to be completely and totally protected. So, I mean, there's ways you can that you can sort of blow your privilege and work product and all that sort of stuff. But but I think I think that um, th that we're all naive if we think we've got you know big walls and ironclads and all that stuff. So yeah, I think from the practitioner standpoint, you know, I disagree with Judge Uhas to the extent that you want to keep that line of demarcation between who's acting as a consultant, who's acting as an expert, oh, right. pretty clean. Oh, no, I'm not arguing that at all. Right. I, that's, that's the issue. So, you right. know, if somebody is somehow converted into an expert in some way, you gotta, you, you are going to face a Pandora's box of problems. You know, I get asked that a lot. I would say at least half of my cases, especially the client will say, well, but why can't you take the stand? And why can't, or the attorney will say, why can't, and it's like, no, when you wear one hat, wear one hat. There are so many people that can do so many other things. There's no need for one person. And it looks like it's, sometimes it's so it's cost effective and everything else. No, it's not. It actually is. You know, and, and taking off on what Joe, Jay Joe was saying, what you know, Judge Uha said, the greater problem comes where you retain somebody as a consultant and then you want them to act as the therapist oh, on yeah. behalf of the kids or do co-parenting therapy or whatever. Mm -hmm. And now you do have potentially very large problems between what their role was in advising you as counsel about what the best practices or the best tools are in the toolbox and how to use them. And then making that person into your general contractor to work with these people and stuff. That's a that's a tough spot to be in. Well, you've got legal problems as the lawyer and the mental health profession's got ethical problems. Right. And so it, there's no win in that at all. Right. You know what? Let me just weigh in on two more things. We are all caretakers as mental health people. So we get very easily lured in because we want to do it all. We want to help it all. And then there's this narcissistic thing. Oh, Dr. Portnova, you can do it. And you're so smart and blah, 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 blah. It's all about the same thing that's the backbone of so much of good mental health professional care. And that is boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. Even if it feels like, oh, I could just do it this once or okay, I'll meet with the family. As soon as you start doing that, you are contaminating your skill set and you're confusing the everybody around you, mostly the 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 clients who are not supposed to be your patients. Otherwise you'd be a therapist, not a consultant. You confuse everybody. So pick a lane and stay in your lane and do a good job. And then refer out to people who can do any other job that's not in your lane. It's very simple and it's very important. To, and I say that from the beginning, I say, I will wear this hat for you. I will never wear another hat. I will be your consultant. I won't be your family therapist. I won't be your individual therapist. And that's really the backbone. Everybody here that's trained in mental health knows that we get trained in that. We get trained in counter-transference and transference and boundaries. This is not different just because it's a forensic environment. It's actually probably more important than ever because the consultant feels like a wishy-washy role. It's really not. It's very specific. So don't get lost in the narcissistic pull or the need to help or all those things that are very difficult sometimes to hold your bootstraps on but it's very important or you're going to do a bad job and you want to do a good job stay the consultant well but that's but that's good advice for judges and good advice for lawyers too. stay in your lane you know <laughs> the, the parties have come before a judge they've asked a specific question answer the question they've asked right. they haven't asked all these 57 other questions don't come back for 57 review hearings mm -hmm. don't well while you're here i know you want to talk about spousal support but Let's talk about something else. No, you've been asked this question, make the decision, get them out of your courtroom in a respectful way. I'm not saying that not, but answer the question you've been asked and, and move it along. Um, 
because I think we all have that that boundary issue and that you know the desire to help and well what can we do to you know no 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 and that's what Mike was saying they want an answer but sometimes when they get an answer they want another answer and another answer and you have to understand we're dealing with people who are grieving the loss of the life they thought they were going to have they're unbundling their life and trying to find and by the way Parties are never at the same, I shouldn't say never, hardly ever at the same level. One person's seen right. the future without the marriage, and the other one's still like trying to get their feet on the ground. So you're seeing people grieving at different stages and families and kids at different stages. Just don't get sucked into the vortex. Stay in your lane, do the job you can do. At the end of the day, that will be more helpful and more stabilizing than getting lost in the confusion and trying to help and actually causing more chaos and more confusion than you ever meant to do. And, you know, I just chip in that we talked about how do you use mental health professionals in your cases to assist you, you know, with clients and the legal problems that are being presented in court. But, you know, I will suggest that having a mental health professional on board is a good way to keep check on yourself as counsel as well. Because a lot of times we do lose perspective, you know, and sometimes it's hard for us not to get invested in what we're doing with our clients and what their position is. And a lot of times we need pushback as counsel to keep things at arm, arm's length and to keep, you know, a, an actual and real perspective on what we're doing. I mean, you know, I, I often kid about I go to see my counselor, you know, Jack Daniels or Jose Cuervo. <laughs> you know, because it's cheaper than going to see J. Joe or whatever. But, you know, this is right. really, really, really tough stuff. Yeah. And at the end of the day, doing some of these cases, you know, if you're not thoroughly exhausted, you know, good for you. But it is That's important to keep that perspective, important to uh, know your limitations as the lawyer and get advice for yourself as well as your clients. You know, one more thing is I've been lucky enough to be doing this for 30 plus years. And the good news is this community, I know sometimes you can get at each other's throat, but it's a really nice community for most of, and I've pe worked with people that are like Mike, who's my friend and my colleague. When you work with people you like and trust, you can say, hey, buddy, what's going on with you? Where what, Can I help you? And Or they'll say, J. Joe, I'm ready to lose my mind with this client. Like I want to just scream and I don't normally feel like that. And that's the best part of being a consultant is you can reach out and go, uh, that was a little harsh or what was that about? Or do you, do you need help with this? Because you're having a hard time reaching the client or the attorney will call me and go, I can't stand this client one more minute, please help me. You know, um, And that's the best part of working in a community with people you trust that know how to work with each other. So I love doing this and I'm lucky to be able to say that. And I think it, it's a perfect place to, to end the discussion. And I think I, I wish I had heard that advice when I first started pra practicing family law. Um, I think now we're going to turn to meet the mental health professionals. And I want to thank all of the panelists for, for your time and, and for a, a really fascinating conversation, sharing your different perspectives. Thank you. So, Alex, will you help us meet the mental health professionals now? Sure. Uh, we'll start with Terry Sanovich. Sanovich. And we have uh, four minutes maximum per person. Okay. Should I just begin? Sure. Go ahead. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Terry Sanovich. I'm a family therapist, and my practice is located in Encino. And um, I, uh, I do child custody work in a variety of ways. I work as a child custody evaluator, reunification therapist, uh, a consultant also. Um, let me think. I work also with children in play therapy um, and either uh, regular therapy or, or forensically based needed uh, informational therapy. Um, I work with couples, uh, individuals, um, just a variety of different things. Um, it depends what's needed. And um, in the, for, in the um, on, on the, uh, what do you call that? that? That questionnaire we filled out, 
basically, I wanted to inform people that uh, there's a lot of uh, concern these days about alienation and in uh, reunification therapy. But I think it's very really important for all of us to remember that there could be um, estrangement going on and often is. And I think that, that changes the trajectory of the therapy if we find that out. And um, it's important to address those things and um, hopefully get a better resolution or hopefully at some point uh, while working with that sort of a case. And um, that's pretty much it. Been doing this for many, many years and um, over 25 at least. <laughs> and um, still, still like it though. Thank you. Thank you. And next, please, is Elena Balashova. Obviously, I did the same. Um, okay. Hi. Um, my name is uh, Yelena Balashova Shamis. It's difficult to pronounce, so I usually go just by Dr. Shamis. I'm bilingual and I work on both languages, English and Russian. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. Uh, my main office is in Marina del Rey, but I have other offices. Um, I work with both children, adults, families, couples, infants, um, family. I think I said family. So to keep it short without reciting my other degrees and what I do professionally for family law, I do family law mediation. I also work as a child expert witness. I work as a consultant and child specialist. Uh, I work with children with disabilities and also children who are in highly gifted spectrum. I also work with the criminal law doing forensic evaluations uh, for mental health diversion. Well, I teach it for universities, including UCLA, I have publications, um, but I think uh, that's enough information for right now. Thank you. Thank you. And next please is V. Ballard. Unmute myself. <laughs> Oh, actually, you muted yourself. You muted yourself. No, I'm unmuted. There you go. Um, I'm a licensed marriage family therapist. I have a private practice in the South Bay. Um, I work with trauma. Um, one of the experts on trauma, Bessel van der Kock, uh, says that trauma comes back as a reaction, not a memory. So a lot of reactions that we see of um, parents and children going through divorce um, are a result of some trauma. I have experience with uh, drugs and alcohol cases. Um, I work as a collaborative divorce coach and child specialist that JJ was referring to before. I also coordinate a high conflict program called Better Parenting, Better Divorce. Although lately, because of the pandemic, we've been having to move that to um, a, Zoom, a Zoom meeting, right? Uh, I do co-parent counseling. I'm a member of um, a collaborative practice group called A Better Divorce. Uh, I do co-parent counseling. And I'm a member of the CP Cal board, past, past member of the CP Cal board, and a member of the LACFLA board presently. I'm trained in EMDR and brain spotting, family systems, and um, I have a lot of knowledge around information around the brain and how our brain impacts how we behave. Uh, that's, that's about most of the things. Um, I too enjoy this work very much. And I think that um, the information that um, the experts this evening has given to us has been very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. And next one is Joanne Fagan. Hi. I can, I'm Joanne Fagan. I'm an LCSW. Been doing working with family law for over 30 years. Um, done over 1,400 neutral child custody evaluations. I also do mediation, co-parent counseling. Worked uh, originally at UCLA's Neuropsychiatric Institute. Have expertise with special needs kids. I think 
my strength is both investigative and psychological assessments of families, getting the data about what they're actually doing and putting it in a condensed form for the court to be able to review if needed, but hopefully to give the families the perspective to work things out and settle. Um, I find that keeping a positive adaptation to stressors such as the COVID pandemic, that the Zoom sessions can be very positive for families, particularly where domestic violence has been an issue and they can be in separate spaces while we're interviewing them and want to keep the best of these difficult times, but also doing in-person work. And um, as an evaluator, I'm a moderate cause for a private evaluator, but difficult for some families. So hopefully can move forward and they can work things out as best as they can. I start in my introduction by encouraging mediation at e either any point in the process with the family court services or their attorneys, or but certainly at the end that they can use the data to work things out. And thank you, my colleagues, for nice to be part of this community and hear interesting stories in people's lives over the years. Still find it interesting. Thank you. And next one, I think we're supposed to have Amy Goldman, but I don't see her listed. Amy, are you here by any chance? If not, next person will be, let me see. It's Richard Gottfried. Richard, if you can please unmute yourself. I am unmuted. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's really wonderful to see so many familiar faces, lawyers and mental health professionals, and uh, I really appreciated the, the panel's discussion. It was very helpful. I wanted to thank uh, Ellen and uh, Deborah uh, for, once again, uh, leading this off. Um, I, uh, I come to uh, the uh, high custody, uh, high conflict uh, divorce and, and custody world uh, as a former uh, corporate lawyer for many years, but I've now been in the field for 25 years uh, as an AFCC member and a, was one of the original uh, LA uh, study group members. Uh, we called it the Mary Lund and Angus Strong group for many years, but now it's uh, broadening out. So. Uh, uh, it's wonderful to continue to learn and, and follow the uh, course of the, the law as it changes. And maybe uh, at some point there might even be a discussion how those of us who work in the field can uh, uh, perhaps even uh, retain counsel uh, to be able to accomplish even more uh, in these very complicated cases. Uh, uh, there's only so much we can do, and sometimes we need to uh, uh, have the help of a judge to intervene, and how might that be uh, done in some of these challenging uh, cases. But I wanted to let you know that I do custody evaluation. I do quite a bit of co-parenting counseling and a lot of individual counseling that's referred both through the courts uh, and uh, often uh, parents will come to me uh, caught in this situation uh, outside of the courts. And that's also true of uh, co-parenting counseling. Sometimes they'll find their way outside of the court uh, order. I do family therapy and I even do marriage ther therapy uh, in the hopes that uh, before they get here, they can pull it together and keep it together. Um, let's see, I have helped uh, uh, families come up with parenting plans and uh, that's uh, also outside of the court situation, but facing it. And I'm trained as a collaborative law coach and specialist. And I have worked with lawyers as a consultant and also worked with custody evaluators to help review their evaluations and make uh, comments for improvements and recommendations. And uh, I do a lot of work uh, in addition uh, as a private therapist. So thank you. Thank you. And next is Carol Hirschfeld. Hi, 
Hi, everybody. Nice to see you all. And um, I want to thank Deborah and Ellen for doing all this work to put this together. I may be known to many of you, and I want you to know that rumors of my retirement are entirely false. Somebody once said, right, the rumors of my demise is, I don't know, premature. I'm not retired. Have gray hair, but not retired. So I am here to say hi to everybody. Um, I don't see myself retiring until, I don't know when. I mean, I, I was listening to whoever said, maybe it was Mike, about we being in our 60s and some of us maybe beyond. Um, but I enjoy what I do. So why wouldn't I keep doing it? So I am a licensed psychologist. I have an office in Los Angeles. I also have an office in Seattle, and I'm actually speaking to you right now from Seattle. Um, I am doing all of my work um, through a HIPAA compliant Zoom. And like JJ, I at first was like, ah, I'm looking at myself. I see my neck. I see all my flaws. But you know what? I actually am learning to do this. And I have to say some of the benefits I have met my clients' cats and dogs. They have walked by them as we talk. It's kind of cool. I have visited bedrooms. Now, I used to sometimes do family therapy in people's homes, but this is a whole other level. Um, I mostly, my practice is mostly psychotherapy for kids, adolescents, and adults. I also am trained and have taught graduate courses in family therapy. I'm a gotten trained couples therapist. I don't know who it was who said trying to keep people to um, avoid divorce. Absolutely a goal. Um, family therapy. I had take a certain limited number of those cases where there is visitation refusal or visitation resistance a much better way to think about reunification therapy. And I have a template, which I am happy to share with the attorneys if um, you want to use it as a way to write an order. I find we have to have both parents involved. It can't just be for the uh, out parent, it has to be for both parents. I'm still teaching my co-parenting class by, you guys like, right? We always did that. I am doing mine by Zoom. And I have to tell you, I actually think in some ways it could be better. People didn't want to sit in the room together across the table. I always felt like I was one of the few people in the room that enjoyed it. And I do think it works fine. So it's still a 12 hour, six week class. It should be a 52 week class, like anger management, right? Fine. So, um, but anyway, Co-parenting with your ex. I have everything on my website. I, it's in there in the book. You are welcome to, you know, steal my forms. Any therapist can steal my forms. Um, anything you want to know about me is in there. I am also a trained mediator. I do custody mediation. I have done that as a consultant through attorneys or I have co-mediated attorneys. I really enjoy that process. And I guess um, maybe last but not least, the collaborative divorce. I also have been trained and have done lots of those um, divorces, both as a divorce coach and as a child specialist and taught the child specialist role for LACFLA for years. And I think I probably said everything. Thank you. Thank you. And next is Renee Liff. Hi. I'd like to also... Um, Thank Ellen and say hi to Deborah uh, and hello to all of you, Rick and Carol. It's nice to see everybody's face. And like most of you, I have done most of the differing uh, roles in, in psychotherapy. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist with a law degree, and I practice psychotherapy Almost all of my practice is concerned with court-related cases. Um, my original six-week uh, mastering the art of co-parenting has kind of evolved into a minimum of six months and sometimes even a year of the most intract, what J 
judges think or thought were intractable cases, really high conflict, uh, people who really disliked each other and the judges just kind of give them to me. And I work with them and try to help and feel that I do help uh, a good portion of them. Some of them I can't, but we're together for six months at least or a year. And it's really, it really is beneficial. I, I love that work. Um, it consumes me. But I also have done and continue to accept, uh, well, some people call it resist refusal cases, others call it conjoint therapy, others call it reunification therapy, uh, a child who resists uh, visiting or custody with a parent. And like Carol said, I'll take those cases only if the preferred parent is on board. Um, I also kind of make determinations in those cases around the age of the child. Um, if a child is younger, there's a better chance of a better result than if a child is a late teenager when they're pretty entrenched in their belief system. So um, I testify as an expert witness and I also uh, create parenting plans I'm certified as a in infant parent mental health, so I can work with issues involving very young children. And um, in general, I have taught, I taught at CSUN. Um, I teach uh, at, I forgot the name of the school that I even graduated from. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, I've had experience in almost all of the areas and I love the difficult cases. Um, I'm, I'm in private practice in Encino and in Thousand Oaks and in Brentwood. And I do work almost exclusively on Zoom, but I will come in to the office for, for children in reunification cases. That's about it. Thank you. Thank you. And next one is Jeffrey Lolo. Hi. I was going to leave it on and do this uh, in mind, but I couldn't figure out how to do it. Um, like so, so far, just about everybody, I've been doing this forever. Uh, I just realized that next year it'll be the 50th anniversary since I was licensed in psychology. And that seems like a very long time. Uh, and yet I'm renewing my lease in my office. So I have been doing uh, my work remotely. Um, I don't use Zoom, I use something called DoxyMe, which is HIPAA compliant and free. Um, <clears throat> I found that working uh, remotely and doing psychological testing uh, works very well, much better than I thought it would. I uh, can observe the uh, individual taking the test while they're working on the computer so that I do have control over the situation. Uh, I am a psychologist. I practice in Encino, but for about the last year, I've been practicing from home like a lot of people. I did child therapy for 15 years. I supervised psychological testing at UCLA and taught about diagnostic evaluations to psychiatrists and psychologists at Cedar sinai when they had a psychiatry department. Um, in addition to doing custody evaluations, I do consult with attorneys. I do 733s. I do some parenting plan coordinating. But I also uh, do evaluations in neuropsychology and for personal injury lawsuits. Uh, I really enjoy work like everybody seems to. And even though I live in a retirement community and everybody keeps asking me, when are you going to retire? The answer is uh, no time soon that I can think of. And uh, I enjoy these meetings every year. I like them better in person because the food was pretty good. Huh? But uh, it works pretty well this way as well. Nice seeing everybody. Thank you for inviting me. Everybody take care, be safe, bye. Thank you.
Thank you. And next one is Kathy Memel. Oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Kathy Memel. I'm a licensed therapist, discernment counselor, mediator, collaborative coach, and co-parent educator specializing in divorce here in Beverly Hills for about 35 plus years. I really care about helping parents, divorcing parents, stay out of the courtroom by mediating their child custody disputes and helping them create workable parenting plans for their reorganizing family. One of the tools I use is the family tree. I have a big tablet for therapists. It's the genogram, but I have a big tablet and I go back three generations and I learn about everybody. And together we discover the family patterns of behavior that get passed on down to the generation. And we look at this from a position of understanding, not blame or criticism. And once they're aware of the patterns that get passed on down, they then have choice. So this is a very simple uh, example, but I had a woman in my office and she said her grandparents were married seven years, had two kids and got divorced. Her parents were married seven years, had two kids and got divorced. And she was sitting in my office and said, oh my God, I've been married seven years, I have two kids and I'm getting divorced. So those unconscious messages that get passed on through the generations are pretty powerful until we learn how to do something different. Um, so I'm here to help divorcing couples feel supported, less alone, less isolated. I listen carefully to help patients navigate the emotions of their divorce and help them make informed decisions, not emotional ones, so they can work more cooperatively with their attorneys and other specialists. So I'm a former family law paralegal and a former conciliation court mediator and happy to be here this evening. And thank you for sharing all your information. Thank you. And next one is Susan Rempel. You're muted, Susan. Susan. <laughs> How's that? Good. good, thank you. Oh, very good. I am a uh, licensed marriage and family therapist who serves as a child custody evaluator leader, a parenting plan coordinator, a family therapist for high conflict families and uh, families with resist refusal issues. I also mediate, testify as an expert witness and serve as a consultant. My practice at this time is virtual and I actually think I'm doing better work, particularly with children because I'm, I've, I've interviewed children who are under their beds in their bedrooms, I've, all sorts of things that you would never have been able to do. And I'm interacting with them on a device which they really see as an extension of themselves. So I plan to continue to do this work um, with the exception of perhaps doing home calls for site visits because I find that when there are large family groups, that's a bit, uh, logistically, it's a, it's a bit difficult. Um, I am on the AFCC California chapter board, and I moderate the study group that Rick was referencing, which um, was just voted to by the board to be transformed into the official study group for the California chapter. So I encourage everybody to join the AFCC wow. California chapter. Yeah, it's a big, big accomplishment, I think. Um, and I like this work so much that I did it for about 15 years. And when I had child number three, I decided to retire because I didn't think I could do both jobs well. And when my youngest got to be 14, she said to me, mom, you should go back to work. And I thought, hey, what a great idea. And I'm having more, I, I'm enjoying it more than I did when I was first in practice. Um, and that's, I think that's it. Thank you. And Next is Robin Sachs. Hi, everybody. Um, so first of all, I am an old lawyer, but a new therapist. Um, I am a former prosecutor of almost, gosh, almost 20 years where I specialized in child sexual assault, child abuse, and what was called domestic violence at the time and stalking. And I was always right next to dependency and family court by virtue of being on a multidisciplinary team. So when I talk to people, I say that I'm trilingual and that I still speak uh, family, criminal, and dependencies. In, in my role, I um, get, so in my, in my practice, I went back to school and got my MSW just about three years ago, or actually 
now five years ago, I'm 120 hours away from licensure, but I have been working as a PPC custody coach, a co-parenting coach, and very often as a consultant and expert to other lawyers, particularly when there are allegations of um, abuse, uh, domestic violence restraining order issues, stalking, or there may be something going on in the criminal court. Um, be, you know, I still practice as a lawyer in a lot of my cases uh, that come in that have this intersection. I get hired under my legal umbrella, which does not make me a mandated reporter when I'm acting in that realm. Um, I am still a uh, forensic interviewer for the county. I work at LA County USC and conduct uh, forensic interviews for LAPD in their Family Justice Center. I'm also a clinician at LA County USC's Violence Intervention Program, where I'm in the Adolescent Care um, Transition Team and part of the Alexis Project, where I have a specialty in LGBTQ and transgender issues. So I'm, I'm also one of these people, just as a side note, is I'm a born and raised third generation Angelino. And if you can tell by my eclectic practice and by my kind of way, I kind of have my hands in a lot of stuff. I'm one of those people that like, if you need a resource, you should call like for everything from like, what's the best dress on Amazon to who do you need as an expert witness to where should you go to lunch to tell me if you know this detective on this case, um, who, what expert do we need to uh, bring in? I am a team person. I love working with other professionals. I come from multidisciplinary team environment and really am trying to bring in my private practice, the same kind of multidisciplinary team attitude that has been successful in the child abuse and uh, sexual assault arena in the in the public uh, sector. So that's a little bit about me and I look forward to getting to know you more. I acted, I think I said what I act at, so I think that's enough for me. <laughs> Thank you. And next is James Walton. There we go. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this group. Um, everybody is so <laughs> impressive. <laughs> Uh -huh. um, I have my doctorate in clinical psychology. I have my master's in family therapy. I'm a licensed family therapist. I've been doing my work for now 30 years. Um, I, I um, do collaborative. I work in uh, collaborative law in, as a coach. Um, I am in two practice groups, uh, law <laughs> and um, FDS, which is Family Divorce Solutions. I've been with them for almost 11 years now. Um, I was on the board of directors for LACFLA, where I was the uh, administrator for continuing education credits. Um, I work for Peace Talks, doing um, divorce mediations for them as a mental health coach in their process. Um, I... Um, I, in the past, I was work, working as a, a 647A um, counselor for uh, offenders in a, diver, in a diversion program uh, for the courts. Um, I, I've run anger management groups um, and I have a private practice in the Valley in North Hollywood um, where I do a lot of work with couples and individuals um, handling a lot of anger management issues with people, helping couples work with their communications to improve them. Um, oh, yeah, I, um, I also am on the faculty for LACFA's uh, basic training where I train new, um, um, be new people interested in collaborative, working together in collaborative law. Um, I, um, I help put together parenting plans. I help people organize their thoughts um, in what they want to accomplish in their divorce. Um, we take a look at their highest hopes to see what it is that they want out of it. I help the attorneys actually ahead of time look at what are some of the hot topic issues that the clients are going to be dealing with. Um, what are some of the, you know, so that they don't touch the third rail um, on um, issues that might happen in, in a case. Um, I explore what the difficult um, issues might be ahead of time so that I can let the attorneys know that I'm working with on a collaborative case, that this might be a, an issue that we need to take a look at. Uh, these are some hot topics you might not want to, um, you might want to tread carefully if we go in that direction. Um, I'd like to take a look at what are the strengths that the couple has in their relationship. Even though they're getting divorced, um, they loved each other one time 
And um, there have to be some good things that were left in that relationship. And one of the goals I like um, trying to accomplish when I'm helping people going through a divorce is saving what's good in that relationship, helping them detangle what's not good and helping them to separate out their lives. Um, I, I tell people that in the process of a divorce, um, this is not the end of the family, it's just the end of the marriage. We're gonna preserve the family as best we can. Um, and helping them take those strengths that they have and use those moving forward because couples will probably know each other for the rest of their lives if they have children. And they wanna be able to go to those birthday parties and those weddings and the other um, family gatherings that they have and be able to be cordial at least with their um, former spouse. And they wanna they want to provide good mo uh, modeling for their own children um, in how to end a relationship if that's going to happen, how to settle differences in a peaceful way and, and an amicable way. So we take a look at um, what are their, um, one of the things I like to do is take a look at how have they had a situation, a difference that they were able to settle and have it come out good and have a good response from it? What were the skills that they used for achieving that good communication during a time when it wasn't going so well? And then maybe we can pull that forward and use some of those same skills when an individual is going through the divorce process, when they're sitting at the negotiating table and being able to convey um, that part of themselves using the best part of themselves in coming to an agreement and also being able to handle disappointment and um, recognizing that there are some things that they need to let go of and learning to be okay with that when it comes time for that. Um, oh, let's see here. Um, I think that's about it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And I think this is it. I think this uh, all the mental health professionals which I had on my list uh, did speak. Uh, did we miss anybody? No, I think that's it. Okay. okay. And I was asked by David Kuroda to send his regards to everyone. He did fill out a questionnaire, which will be in the materials, but he wasn't able to attend tonight and he asked me to let everyone know that while his office is closed he is still practicing so um, keep him in mind and, and know that he's thinking of everyone tonight. Um, we have a few extra minutes if any of the mental health professionals have a tip that they'd like to offer to the attorneys either how we can better work with you or things you think we might be able to do to help our clients as as the world starts opening up or ways you can help our clients as the world start opening up if you would on the chat function just let me know that you want to be heard and um alex will will put you back on if anybody wants to to say anything else before we go to the breakout sessions Okay, well, th I want to thank everyone for, for showing up tonight. I know for the mental health professionals, this can be prime client time for you. So taking the time to come speak to the family law bar, um, we appreciate that you, you've taken yourself away from your clients. Um, Deborah, I'll let you have the last word before we go to the breakout sessions. Okay, well, I just want to thank everyone, uh, Judge Juhas, uh, Dr. J. Joe Portnova, Mike Kretzmer, and all the mental health professionals are here, and Ellen, of course, and all the mental health professionals who are here tonight uh, for being with us. I thought this was very enjoyable and a great program. Thank you all. Thank you, Ellen, for all your work, too. Great, and we'll see you all next year. <laughs>